your body and your church, Lord. And we pray for power, Lord, an increase in power. Mm. Lord, we pray for whatever there was before to be multiplied mm. and for it just to catch up on anything that might have been halted in this season of slowing things down. Mm. But Lord, we pray for that dam to be opened mm. and for it to be released. So we just pray for your peace and a lightness tonight for Putty as mm. he speaks your word. Amen. Amen. Bless you, buddy. Amen. Woo. It's a bit of a trick to have like the movement prayer guys pray for you before you talk. That's a dose. <laughs> um, I wanted to settle in tonight by asking um, Kathy if she would be willing to share her story real quick. Kathy Downs, come on up. I know many of you know who Kathy Downs is. If you do not, then you're about to hear a little bit about who she is. And Kathy was with us in Victoria last week. And there was some really cool things that happened. And so would you just share those with us real quick, Kathy? Yeah, I'd, it'd be an honor to. And some of you have heard the story because I keep talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> As you should. Uh, yeah, but uh, the last uh, seven days have been uh, very, very significant for me, like they have for a lot of people. Started off with some lovely prayer from Emily on the, on the first night of the conference because I just felt so uh, depleted and dry. And... Um, and then it kind of just snowballed from there. The, the background is that, um, uh, well, well, Pete and I started our pastoral ministry journey in 1981. Do you remember 1981, buddy? <laughs> I came around a couple of years after that. <laughs> so it's been a long time. Um, and it's been like wonderful cycles of blessing and mm. challenge and blessing and struggle and we planted churches and we were had the privilege of being national direct for, directors for 13 years and um, that was that was an amazing time but um, like others I think I carry some war wounds from those years and by the time I got to 2019 we handed our church over to Sam and Ruth Buscombe and, um, you know, that was a good round 40 years, you know, mm. like, and, and so we both kind of said, yeah, we're done. And I said to Pete, yeah, we're done, aren't we? We're done. <laughs> and he agreed, yeah, we're done. And, um, but I was really done. Like, I was done, I think, in every way. Like, every bucket was empty. You know, my, my people bucket was empty. My ministry bucket was empty. My church bucket was empty, um, and I, for the first time in my adult life, I, I really didn't have any sense of calling. And uh, I thought, okay, well, it's the age I am. You know, I'm going to be a nana. I'll be a nana and I'll garden. <laughs> and then we lived in, we moved out to a beautiful country block. And after a year of uh, letting nature and the Lord um, refresh us, Pete started to get twitchy. I suppose there's no surprise there, but he wanted to re-engage with pastoral <laughs> ministry again. And I just kept saying, no, well, you go ahead, honey, but I'm done. And I, I've, I just kept saying it, like even flippantly to people, oh, yeah, Pete's not done, but I'm done. And um, I didn't realise how much I was saying it. Um, anyway, Sunday morning, we, um, we picked up Phil uh, from New Jersey we took him over to Westgate Vineyard Church. Um, our daughter, Julia, and her husband, Aaron, pastor there. And we joined them for Sunday morning. I didn't know that Phil was going to preach about uh, the barren places <laughs> blooming again. Um, and in worship, I just kind of felt the Holy Spirit convict me uh, and say, you know, you're, you're saying you're done and you're not done I don't want you to be done and um, so I yeah I just it just like I saw what it was that I was saying over myself eh? and I just repented and told the Lord I was really sorry and and that if he didn't want me to be done I wouldn't be done <laughs> um, yeah it was just really simple like that and we had a lovely message and we had some prayer and we're packing up church um, and we're putting away the chairs and a woman who I've known for years, who, has, who herself has been in ministry for decades, um, just said, oh, look, would you pray for me before we go? 
And I, I knew she'd had cancer, but I didn't realise how serious it was. And, and, you know, she nearly lost her life. And she was telling me some of the effects of the treatment that she was still carrying in her body. Um, her vocal cords had, had been damaged. She had lymphedema. She had gone blind in one eye and the other eye had limited vision. Um, and she'd been a very prophetic woman and I'd... Over the years, I'd just seen her minister in power. And, and she, she just said she felt so exhausted from the struggle. Um, so I said, yeah, sure. And another woman and I prayed for her. And, like, my, my run rate uh, with physical healing is pretty low. <laughs> and if someone needs physical healing, I usually look for Pete, you know. <laughs> and he, if, he, if someone wants emotional healing, like, he'll look for me. But... Anyway, we've decided we'll stop doing that. Um, yeah, so we lay hands on her and, and I, just, I just felt to, to pray for the, the restoration of her prophetic gift and the restoration of her voice because she was quite a teacher as well. And um, she was beautifully easy to pray with. She just agreed with everything. Um, and the, the Holy Spirit started to hit her really obviously and we prayed and prayed and... She kept her eyes closed and um, after a little while we stopped and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, okay, all right, you know, nothing will have changed. So she opens her eyes and she goes, I can see you. (laughs) And um, I can see your face. You're blurry, but I can see your face with her blind eye. Um, And so we pray again and... um, she does it again. Yeah, I can see. I can see your features on your face. Um, she said, but there's a bit of you missing. You know, so her kind of peripheral vision. <laughs> so Pete comes over at this stage and we pray again. And um, Pete asks her to open her eyes and, and we, we can see her eyes have changed. You know, like she's surprised, so they're big. But, um, but they looked open, didn't they? It was amazing. Yeah, and, and so she's... <laughs> She's very excited, saying, I can see, I can see you all, I can see all of you now. And um, her glasses, she put her glasses on the table. Um, and so she sees them there and she puts them on and then she really screams. <laughs> it's like, oh, I can really see you now. So, um, yeah, her, her vision got restored. Um, it was, yeah. <laughs> Come on, Jesus. Yeah. Come on, yeah. Jesus. And... Um, yeah, and I got restored. <laughs> Come on. Amen. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Woo! <clears throat> I think there are some important things happening in our intergenerational family here. Um, Pete, or not Pete. <laughs> Um, that one's Peter. Um, <laughs> Greg mentioned to me, uh, I don't know if any of you guys could hear it, uh, we had a conversation in Rob and Bonnie's workshop this afternoon, and Rob and Bonnie were teaching, and then they said, hey, turn to each other and you know, ask each other this question, and so we were chatting to each other, and, and, uh, and, Greg, and Greg goes, hey, how are you on interpretation of tongues? And, you know, we talked a little bit about that. And he said, yeah, I don't think I've ever done that. (laughs) And so, uh, I don't know if any of you heard it, but after he interpreted that tongue, he leaned over to me and he said, I've never done that before, buddy. (laughs) Now, this is important. This is important. For the first time in our history, we are a three-generational vineyard family. There is a, a, a founding generation here. Includes people like the Downses, right? People like Greg. People like the Henrys back there. And there are others as well I know. These are the ones I can recognize the name, you know, standing in front of everyone with the lights, right? To you guys, I want to say something. Like Kathy said, you're not done. There, there shifts in this season the concrete responsibilities change for you. You're the founding generation because you were the founding generation. So you founded stuff. And that was what you had to do. 
But if you're playing this role right, you're probably not stewarding the things you founded anymore. That's actually the right thing. But the shift of that administrative responsibility does not mean that your assignment's done. Because what happens is your assignment has shifted from ownership to inheritance. Inheritance is something that has to be stewarded by the grandparents. And it's actually best stewarded if you're not running around putting out church fires. Believe it or not. <laughs> and so to the founding generation, I just want to say we need you guys to stay in the game because you carry a spiritual blessing, a spiritual inheritance that we need to multiply on past you. This is a real and a concrete and an important thing. The kind of thing that sometimes for us in the West we might miss. Because we're just like, oh, a blessing. That's like saying an encouraging word to someone. But in the scriptures, blessings are far richer and more powerful than that. Think of Abraham, or think of Isaac and Jacob and Esau. Esau gets tricked out of the blessing by Jacob. He goes to his dad, Isaac, and he goes, do you have any blessing for me left? And you know what Isaac says? I don't have it anymore. The only way that makes sense to me, personally, is if a blessing is a literal spiritual object. I gave it to your brother. I actually don't have it to give anymore. It's gone. It's in his hands. It's not just a kind word you say over someone. There is a spiritual object that is the essence, the DNA of this family. And it's your guises to bless it and to give it away. It's your guises to lay hands on generation two, of which there are now many people in the room. <laughs> and generation two, you guys are now in the stretch of leading and leaning in to vineyard things for yourself. And your assignment is actually ownership. Your assignment is, okay, we've received this story, we've received this DNA, we've received this inheritance, but now we have to live it out fully for ourselves. And there's something in this like generation two, this ownership generation, where there's like the thing that's on like Elijah and Elisha. You remember that? It's like right after uh, you know Elijah's back up in heaven, Elisha comes across and he hits the ri he comes to the river, grabs the cloak, smacks it on the river, and he says, "Where's the God of Elijah? God, will you show up for me?" Like I've heard the stories of how you showed up for those who came before me. Will you be the same God to me that you were to them? And so we need our, our, our forefathers giving us that inheritance, reminding us of those stories. This is how God has showed up for the vineyard. But what we need to do is to have the courage, the tenacity to step into that and say, okay, I've heard those stories, now I have to get my own stories. Now I have to be willing to be the crazy one and do the crazy thing. I have to be willing to be the one who steps out and interprets the tongue in the room. When it's like, that's awkward. <laughs> right? There's an ownership piece that we have to have. We have to step in. And I just want to commend us, our generation. This is like my generation too, right? Okay? This is something that comes at cost, but if you give it your yes, what happens is generation by generation, what God's doing actually picks up and accelerates. Elisha does more than Elijah, right? He does like twice the miracles, at least twice the miracles recorded in the scriptures, right? So there's an acceleration. If you'll own it, it will not only come upon you, it'll pick up. And what our task is for this generation, if you're kind of in my-ish generation, right? <laughs> our assignment is to own every bit of it, to grab it, to say, I'm going to be vineyard too, whatever that means. And each of us have little different niches and little different assignments in there. But I'm going to be vineyard too. Can I commend you? Be vineyard and be bold, okay? Go for it. And don't confuse the structures with the spirit. What I mean by that is this. Our generation, there's lots of conversation about the structures that have to pass on. How does this church keep running? 
How does this ministry keep going? All of those things are awesome. But what our forefathers and foremothers in the spirit received was not a structure. What they received was the kingdom of God smacking them, turning their life upside down, wrecking them, ruining the course of their lives, and making them run off and do crazy things like plant five churches like Peter and Kathy did. When I'm sure there were lots of other more lucrative options on the table. <laughs> right? If you, if you are stewarding a church or a ministry or whatever, that's important. God's using that. I'm not saying neglect that. But what I'm saying is, make sure you don't only get the vessel of the ministry and miss the spirit that sits behind it. That's the thing. That's the real inheritance. It's the spiritual thing. It's the thing that makes you do the crazy choices. That's ours to receive. And we not only have this generation, we actually have a third generation, which is also in the room. I got to spend a little bit of time with some of them earlier, and there's others as well. I can see some of you in the back, right? <laughs> this is for you as well. There's a story that God has been starting and writing with us, and it gets to be your story too. And so your job in this is to soak up that story. Your job is to experience God. Your job is to realize that for whatever reason, God has picked this group of people. I don't know why. I don't know why he picked us. But he picked us, this group of people, to gift us a certain way of being the church. And is it perfect? Of course it's not perfect. We're still a bunch of human beings. Is it the best way out there? I don't even know if that sentence makes, like that question makes sense. It's not about good, bad, best, or whatever. What it's about is that the Lord has given us a thing. It's a way of being with each other. It's a way of being with him. And it's a beautiful way that he wants to use in your life like he's used in so many of the lives of the people around you. And can I tell you something exciting? You don't have to wait to get old for that to start happening. It's better if you don't wait. It's better if that starts for you today. The Holy Spirit knows who you are even if you're not an adult yet. In fact, Jesus says maybe even in this kind of way of Christianity, it might be better to be a younger than an adult. And he says to those of us who are older than the adult line, maybe you should become like the ones who are younger. So this is on the table for you. And for you, I just want to commend you. Jump in the pool. Like, there's so much fun. I'll tell you what, it is so much harder for adults to heal the sick than it is for kids and teenagers. I totally mean that. I've done lots of equipping with both. Like, kids and teenagers, we need your help. Because for whatever reason, we get all up in our head. And it's weird for us. And we, we do things like pray and expect it not to work. Right? We need your help. Jump in the pool. Experience it for yourself. And maybe even show us a thing or two. Remind us some of the things we've forgotten. We have these three layers. There's an inheritance layer. There's an ownership layer. There's an experience layer. This is the first time this has happened here. I mean, not maybe like this year, but you know, over the last few years, it's like the first time it's finding its way into that shape. All three of them matter. All three of them are beautiful. All three of them are so important. And wherever you're at in that, just own it. Own 100% of it. Because each one of them like reinforces and solidifies the others and makes them all better. And so there's this like, it's like a three-cylinder engine, kind of. You know, it's like this, this, this first generation is firing and Kathy goes, hey, can I tell you what? If we stay in the game, we can open blind eyes, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then who knows? Like some eight-year-old in the back is probably like, wait, we can open blind eyes? Like, I want to do that tonight, <laughs> you know? And then they go for it. And then you know what happens? It's like, I'm like, oh my gosh, like the eight-year-old's going for the blind eyes and I'm like not doing that anymore. I need to get back in this game, you know? And it's like there's, there's this, this synergy that happens. In, in the book of, this is like the last, this whole thing is the warm-up to my sermon. I hope this is okay. Is this okay, guys? Is this all right? Okay. Um, the very last verses of the Old Testament, very, very last ones, in the end of the book of Malachi, such an interesting thing, right? These are the words that are like looking forward to the coming of Jesus, right? This is so fascinating to me. He says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet 
before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. It's a really weird verse, and particularly that last one we usually drop off. You know, we're like, Elijah's going to come, hearts of the fathers and the sons, yay, isn't that warm? And then there's that last verse that's like, otherwise I'll come and blow you all up, right? (laughs) That's kind of a weird verse, but what's happening here, what's being said is this. God is saying this, I've decided I'm coming. That's going to happen. And when I come, it's either going to be really great or it's going to be not great. How many of us know that when the Spirit of God moves, the energy and the move of the Spirit can either be creative or destructive? Right? We, 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 maybe we don't think about that other side. Sometimes we're like, Lord, come. And he's like, you're not ready yet. <laughs> you think you're asking for something great, but if I show up, it's going to blow things apart. But what the Malachi says, he says this, the wineskin that's going to allow my visitation to be creative instead of destructive is intergenerational unity. I'm going to come. I'm going to tilt the hearts of the fathers and the sons to each other. So when I show up, it doesn't blow things apart. It blesses, it grows, it enriches We actually have the opportunity to live that out as a family. I'm so excited about that. So, first generation, keep going for it. Don't back off. We need you. This isn't a two-generational story. It's a three-generational story. Speaking of, I would love to talk about our story as the Vineyard family. I think this is the kind of thing that's important because it's the story we're all living in and the story we're all living from. And so I want to talk a little bit about that tonight and probably tomorrow night as well. And this will thread into the idea of naturally supernatural and all of that as we go. But we're going to start a little bit upstream of that. And so, um, Belinda, you told me you've got some stools or something lined up. Oh, look at these guys. This is great. I don't know what's happening here, but I think some things are about to magically appear. So I've got three stools here because I learned my lesson in Victoria. I welcomed a few people up to the stage for what I thought would be like five or ten minutes and turned out to be more like 50. So um, sometimes I'm not always awesome on estimating things with time. There's actually already been some conversation about that this week in other places. Some of you know who I'm talking about. Um, we'll say this will work. Okay. I would love, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mix up a little bit on my list here. Kathy, we've already had you up here. Would you be willing to come up again? Can I seat you in this nice, comfortable looking stool? You get the most comfortable one. That's very good. Come on up, Kathy. Um, I would love to snag Greg again because Greg is my Isaiah, and I think that will always, always and forever be true. <laughs> Uh, let's see, and, and is Bonnie in here? I just feel like asking Bonnie Giles if she'll come up. Will you come on up here, Bonnie? You have no idea this is happening. I hope this isn't an uncomfortable stool for you. Um, but you'll only be there like an hour, so it'll be fine, you know? <laughs> it'll be fine. Okay, so I have brought these three up because they're a visual for me. They're a visual illustration. And what I want to talk about tonight is I want to talk about the story of the scriptures and how that helps us understand this thing called the kingdom of God. And I brought these three up because I think one of the more helpful ways to think about the story of the scriptures is to almost think about it as if it's a trilogy. And so these are Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3. Act 1 starts at the very beginning of the scriptures and goes through until about the time of, say, David or Solomon. And so you've got Genesis, you've got Exodus, and the people of Israel coming out of Egypt. They march through the wilderness for a while, come into the promised land. They, they settle, the judges, 
All of that happens, and then eventually they decide they want a king, and so we've got uh, first Saul, and then we've got David, and we've got Solomon. So there's like a long stretch there. We've got a long, long period of time. This is Act 1, and this is what Kathy is going to represent for us. Then Act 2 is the part of the Bible that we kind of tend to lose in terms of what's going on in, in the story. If you grew up or you've hung around on Sunday mornings for any period of time, you probably mostly track with Act 1. You're like, oh, I get it. Like, okay, story from, we got Noah's Ark, you know, we've got all these cute stories. It, like, kind of makes sense. But then what happens is in Act 2, two things happen that make it hard to follow. The first is the united people of Israel here split into two nations. And so now we're tracking, like, a northern section and a southern section. And that makes the historical literature confusing. We've got all of these weird names. We've got, you know, Jeroboam and Rehoboam and blah, 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 all these. And it's always bouncing back and forth, and you're kind of like, what's going on? I don't understand what's happening here. So the historical literature gets weird. But then the other thing is that most of the literature in this second act, which starts after Solomon and goes through the end of the Old Testament, most of the literature is the prophets. It's the prophetic literature. So I picked Greg because in my mind, Isaiah looks like Greg. Doesn't he, doesn't, he, doesn't he look like that to you? I mean, maybe the beard's just a little bit longer, maybe a little whiter, but, you know, this is, this is what Isaiah looks like to me. And I mean that in the dearest compliment, my dear friend, okay? And so, and so <laughs> it could be worse. Yeah, I could have said Jeremiah. There's, yeah, yeah, there's a few of them that have to, like, you know, cook bread over poop and weird things like that. So, so, and then we have, we have this gap of time, the scripture stop at the book of Malachi, the Old Testament stops, and we've got this gap about 400 years there, where it's, it's kind of like, what's going on? Turns out, like, all of the historical context shuffles around for a little while. And then we come to Act 3, which is Bonnie here, which is the New Testament. That's not so bad, right? You're right. Okay, so we've got the New Testament. Now, I want to think a little bit about trilogies and how trilogies work. Um, you've probably seen at least one of them. As a reference point, I'll grab Star Wars and Lord of the Rings because most people have seen at least one of those two. If you haven't, I'm sorry, but just think about whatever trilogy you've seen. I would imagine the same dynamics are going to happen in, in those stories as well. So what happens in the first episode of a trilogy? We're talking about episode four for Star Wars, okay? Not the prequels. Don't need to go into the prequels, okay? So the, the original one, right? Or Fellowship of the Ring, if we're talking Lord of the Rings. What happens in the first sequence is, first of all, we introduce the world. Like, what on earth is even happening here? Who are these characters? We introduce the plot. What's wrong with the world that we're working to fix? We kind of define good versus evil, right? And we set up an arc that we're going to keep following through the rest of the trilogy. So in Star Wars, we're introduced to the, the Jedi, right? Space ninjas. Who knew there were space ninjas, right? And we learn about this thing called the Force that they have to learn to do, right? And this weird kid from the sort of backwoods of the galaxy gets called in, and we learn, oh, there's this, there's this kind of epic universe of good versus evil when it comes to the Force, right? And there's the struggle, and they eventually blow up the Death Star, and it's like, oh man, this is amazing. And we end episode four understanding this is like a sort of a cosmic good versus evil with space ninja story. Okay? In Fellowship of the Ring, it's, you know, the world's very different. We have a world with like all these different races. We've got elves and dwarves and hobbits and weird trees and all these things, right? And, and, and sitting in this world, there's this like corruptive force, this corruptive power that's embodied in this little, this little ring. And we've got this strange little guy, Frodo, who for whatever reason sort of fumbles his way into realizing like, I have to take this ring and throw it in a volcano, right? And so they get a bunch of, a bunch of people together and they, they band out and they start setting off and of course, they hit detours and all of this stuff, and, and by the end of the first episode, what we see is, is that this little fellowship itself has begun to be corrupted by the ring. So they set off in unity, and by the end of episode one, that's kind of fractured into a few different groups, and we're wondering, like, oh man, are they going to be able to make it all the way to the volcano to throw it in, or one of these bad things going to happen? Now, in a trilogy... 
the second episode is always a little bit unsatisfying. That's not a personal indictment at all, my friend. It's always just a little bit unsatisfying because it can't resolve the story arc, right? Otherwise, we'd be in the last episode, right? So the second episode can't resolve the story arc. But what it does do is in order to make the arc actually interesting and worth reading and not just like one giant pause, what the second um, act in a trilogy always does is it actually transforms the plot and it changes the arc that's set up in the first narrative into something that's kind of deeper and richer that we didn't realize it was before we move into the third act. So in, the, in our Star Wars universe, right, we, we have Empire Strikes Back. And in Empire Strikes Back, we have a lot more of the same Star Wars universe that we've seen before, right? It's like, oh, they're on a snowy planet. We didn't know they had those. And oh, there's a weird puppet who's also a Jedi ninja, right? And we learn all of these things. But where act, the Empire Strikes Back really culminates is in the last five minutes when Luke and Darth Vader are squaring off and they're fighting and he, and he cuts his hand off, you know, it's that weird scene. He's like screaming, ah! And then, and then Darth Vader delivers those iconic words, right? I am your father. And in that, you realize, I thought we were talking about a story about space ninjas and good and evil out there. But what I realize is we're actually talking about the story of good and evil within a family. This isn't just all out there anymore. We're talking about a redemptive arc that lives within a family unit. The plot's been deepened. It's been enriched. It's been transformed. In the Two Towers, we have an arc that kind of goes the other way, right? At the end of uh, Fellowship of the Ring, you know, they're like, can we do it? And Sam's like trying to be positive, and Frodo's like, I don't think we can, just kind of like they do for the whole series. And then <laughs> we come into the Two Towers, and we realize that like, oh, well, while they keep going towards Mordor, they, they kind of keep bumping in to these situations where it's like, oh, the wizards... We thought the wizards were good guys, but it turns out some of the wizards are bad guys, and the wizards are trying to kill the people, and then we go to this other place, and we find out, like, oh, the king has been, like, corrupted and overtaken, and, like, he needs to be delivered, and we have to have a fantastic deliverance scene, thank you, um, Peter Jackson, you know, and, and what happens in that is the two towers transforms a plot that in episode one starts with the fracturing of a single unit of people. We had nine people heading out. That's been split apart because the corrupting influence of the ring broke it up. In the two towers, what we see is that corrupting influence of the ring isn't limited to only those, that fellowship of the ring. That corrupting influence of the ring is, is corrupting everything that there is. The good wizards who are supposed to be like the guardians have been corrupted and they've fallen and they're serving Saruman. And the good kings who are supposed to ride their horses out to battle are like all like cloudy and weird and you know all that kind of stuff. It it becomes a story that gets elevated to like the whole world. We're trying to save the whole world here. Every race has been corrupted by this. And so the second act always kind of transforms the plot. It deepens it. It enriches it. It it kind of like gives it teeth in a way that it didn't have teeth before. Not that it was like a bad story, but it, it just turns it over into a new layer. And then what happens by the time we come to the third act, I'm getting warm here, by the time we come to the third act, it's time to go Benny Hinn. No. <laughs> <laughs> Kirk, you kind of wish we could do that, don't you? <laughs> Only a little. Um, by the time we get to the third act, what happens is all the threads from both of these first two have to flow through and reach a resolution here that completes the arc of the original and the transformed arc of the second and kind of sums it all together. And so in Return of the Jedi... Luke has to win both as a Jedi and as a son, right? He has to, he has to redeem the, the, the Jedi order and he has to get his father back. And so the real culmination of the scene is, is the end when there's that scene and he's with Obi-Wan Kenobi and it's like, oh, he did redeem his family. That was really cool, right? 
In, in the, the return of the king, right, we have to not only get rid of the ring, we have to, like, save humanity. And so it's not just about Frodo and Sam sneaking into mortar and throwing it in the ring, right? Like, the king has to come back, and he has to have the big sword, and they have to fight the Nazgul and all those things, right? And we have to, like, take Gondor back, because what we have to do is, like, reclaim the whole world here, not just deal with the ring, although we have to do that too. We have to kind of resolve both of these arcs. This is the sort of way a trilogy works. And in the Bible, it turns out, it works really similarly. The Bible is set up the same way. But most of us, myself included, this first act feels good. I understand it. This makes sense. We've got a people of God, you know? They were under the oppression of Pharaoh, and and God shows up. We've got, let my people go, and the Ten Commandments, and all of this. And then they wind up, you know, coming out from Egypt, and they settle in the Promised Land, and and they build the, the, the tabernacle, and all of these things, right? Like, I'm tracking with all of this. But then when I get here, everything feels jumbled and confusing. And I'm like, I don't... I don't understand this. Isaiah's hard. This is weird. And so for a lot of us, at least for me, my tendency is like, this is like a really big gap. And then what I do is I try and pick up here, but if I don't understand how the plot's been like deepened and transformed, then now I've got this really big hole between way back there and here. And now I'm trying to read and understand Jesus in a way that isn't continuous with the scriptural story. And so what tends to happen is we just sort of make something up. Like, what is Jesus here to do? I don't know. It looks like maybe he's here to do that. And we fill in the gaps rather than understanding Jesus as the fulfillment of the story. So one of the key questions is, what's happening here? What's this part all about? This is strange. Well, what's happening here is the same thing as in any trilogy. The plot is deepening, it's richening, it's being transformed. And the way that that's specifically happening is it's being transformed by the Israelites' response to the challenge of their identity that this season provides. So in Act 1... We have not just a bunch of nice Sunday school stories. We have the story of the foundation of a people. And the foundation of that people, the foundation of their nation, is in particular built on this set of events that happens essentially through most of the book of Exodus, right? Starts with them burdened under slavery, they cry out to God, and says God sees them. God saw, God knew, and God cared. And then God decides to start showing up. And so he meets Moses in a burning bush, and he says, I'm going to give you these signs, and he sends them back, and there's this dramatic, this powerful confrontation of God with all of the things going on with Egypt. And in that process, God sort of flexes his God muscles and delivers his people from the burden of slavery they were under. And don't forget, at this point in time, Pharaoh and Egypt are the world's most powerful civilization. So we're talking about like the world's leading despot, right? And we've got all of his slaves who get set free because their gods saw them and heard them and acted on their behalf. And as a great sort of triumph of the whole thing, not only does God do all of those things, but he takes it one step further and he says, now would you build this really interesting, unique tent Because I actually want to come live with you guys too. And so we have the God of the whole universe who sees this people, hears this people, acts on behalf of this people, and decides to step into their story and live among this people. And this is the set of stories that this nation tells to understand their self-identity. Every nation does this. I don't know what the the stories are that are involved like the founding of the Australian nation. I need to find that out because I feel like this would have been a better sermon if I'd have done that, right? But I know in the United States, we have a set of stories that we tell that kind of encapsulate what it means to be an American and they're connected to our 
founding like story, right? So you've got this great story about like dumping a bunch of tea in the ocean. That one's for you, Peter, right? And we, <laughs> we've got this great story about throwing a bunch of tea in the ocean because we don't believe in taxes. And then we've got this great story about Paul Revere riding through the colonies. The British are coming. The British are coming. We've got the story about George Washington sailing across the Delaware. Like we have these stories and we tell them because sort of embodied within them to us is something of what it means to be an American. It's like our identity, our ethos, it's like, it's like caught up in this. And now what, 250 years later, we're still telling the same stories. We've transformed them. We turn them into rap musicals now <laughs> instead, but we're still telling the same stories and the stories actually still have the same lessons, right? This is what it is to be an Israelite. That's their story. And so there's a profound national identity that's like caught up in this thing. But the twist happens when we come to Act 2. Because in Act 2, all the momentum that's been building here looks like it goes sideways and inside out. And we have, first of all, the people of God who are like united and under God's rule and all that. First of all, they start splitting. There's disunity. There's a north, there's a south. They're actually fighting against each other and all those things. They start worshiping other gods. And all kinds of things go south until eventually what happens is first the north gets conquered, kind of scattered to the wind. And then eventually the south, a couple hundred years later, gets conquered, dragged out to Babylon, hangs out in Babylon for a little while, then comes back, rebuilds the temple. But along the way, the prophets have all of these really uncomfortable visions. Visions like Ezekiel, who sees, a pro, who sees a vision of the temple, and the Spirit of God goes, I am out of here, Whew, flies away. What does that mean if part of your national identity is we're the people God lives among? And then we come back, and we rebuild the temple and oh, I remember these stories from Act 1, right? Moses built the tabernacle, and the Spirit of God came, and nobody could stand up. And then Solomon builds the temple, and the Spirit of God came, and nobody could stand up. And then they rebuild the temple, and nothing happens. Wait a minute. I thought we were the people that God lived among. But he left, and then we rebuilt his house, and he didn't come back. Wait a minute, hold on. We were conquered by the Babylonians, and then we lived under century after century after century after century of rule of the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans and all of their gods, who every day are saying, our God's bigger than your God, otherwise we wouldn't have beat you. And the people of Israel start crying out again. Wait, we've heard the story. We remember our story began with this story. It was like there was a pharaoh and he was ruling over us and now it's like we're back there again and we're being ruled by foreign nations and we're calling out to God, but wait, nothing's happening. I thought we were the people that God saw. I thought we were the people that God heard. I thought we were the people that God acted on our behalf. I thought we were the people that God lived among, and all of these things are gone. By the end of this act, before the beginning of this act, you have closing in on a thousand years. That is a very long time. So what happens to these people in this part of the journey? What happens is the same thing that happens to all of us when our identity is challenged. You ever have someone challenge a part of your identity? If you, if you have had that experience, you probably did one of two things. When someone challenges a part of your identity, whether it's a big part of your identity or a small one, right? Someone might challenge my identity and they'd be like, you're a bad dad, right? And I would be like, oh, you think I'm a bad dad? I'm gonna be such a good dad, your kids are gonna be wishing I was their dad, <laughs> right? What happens is one of two things. One is we could fold. You're right, I am a lousy dad. Maybe I should just give up, right? Or the second thing that happens is we dig our heels in and we fight, right? 
What happens in this story is the Israelites are presented with that same dilemma. Wait a minute, are we the people that God sees, that God knows, that God acts among, that he comes to live with this? Like, are we or are we not? Because we tell all these stories. I've heard all these stories for a thousand years, but I'm not seeing it. And what winds up happening is this provides the backdrop in which this plot line deepens and enriches. And there's a set of these guys that look like Greg Trainer called the Prophets. They begin to look at this story and they begin to cast it in a kind of higher and higher and higher set of language. At first, the conversation is about, like, God, would you come and, like, deliver us again? Like, we heard that you did this thing with the Egyptians. Would you do it again with us? But then what happens is, as time goes on, they start elevating the conversation further and further and further. And they take the theme that's established in this first one, which is a theme of God is the Exodus God. And they elevate that idea out past where it can fit within just a national story. And they begin to elevate the idea of God as an Exodus God beyond a people group of Israel, and they elevate it up to the level of the entirety of creation itself. And so they start saying things like, the day is going to come when the Lord will come and the lion will lay down with the lamb. That's a story, not just about like Israel's going to be redeemed. They're saying there's a cosmic order here. The animals aren't supposed to eat each other the way they do. And someday, there's going to be a creational exodus that's going to deliver creation itself from the bondage that it's under. It's going to deliver creation itself from the bondage of sin and death. And it's going to render creation itself set free. And the only language we can use for that is language like the lion will lay down with the lamb. Or I'm going to take the heart out of you, a heart of stone, and I'm going to put a new heart in you, a heart of flesh. I'm going to literally change the architecture of your humanity. There's a part of your humanity that's caught up with the stoniness of the fallenness of this world, and I'm going to give you a personal exodus. And in the midst of that, I'm going to create a new covenant, because that's what he did after the exodus, right? I'm going to create a covenant, and you're going to be my people, but you're going to be a different way to be my people than you've ever been before. And I'm going to pour out my spirit, not just on like Moses or Aaron or whatever, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. What's happening here? is the plot is deepening, it's transforming, and the idea is becoming that like it's not just the Israelites that need a second exodus. It's all of creation that needs an exodus. All of creation is caught under a bondage. All of creation is captive. And God is the God who's going to see, who's going to hear, who's going to act, and who's going to come live among his creation. There's an archetype here that kind of the archetype of God is the Exodus God that gets driven up to the cosmic level in act two of the story. And what happens is this is all the meaning that's packed in the story of the scriptures by the time we come to act three. It's all of this rich layers of when is creation itself going to be Exodused? And then what happens is Jesus comes. Jesus shows up in Act 3, and he grabs all of this meaning, just like Luke Skywalker grabs everything of what it means to be a Jedi and to be a son, right? He grabs all of this meaning, and he brings it forward, and he starts acting out the creational exodus. Jesus in himself. And so he walks around and he starts talking about there's going to be a new kind of reality. It's called the kingdom of God. It's reality under God's rule instead of under Pharaoh's rule. Pharaoh being Satan, the one who Jesus calls the Lord of this world. And so he ties into that and he starts saying, guys, this is going to happen. And it's not just that he talks about it, it's that he actually lives as if it's true and already happening. So he's like, let me show you a little bit about creational exodus. It looks like this. The sick are healed. The demonized are set free. The lepers are cleansed. 
The dead, even, are raised up. This is what it looks like when the creational exodus happens. And what happens is this creational exodus along the long arc of the scriptures is a sort of reflective mirror image to an event that starts right at the very beginning, which we usually call the fall. The fall is a thing where what happens is not just like does humanity sin and have sin issues to deal with. That's 100% in there. But the idea of the fall to the Hebrews is the kind of reality we live in changes. Before there was a kind of reality where Adam and Eve could like literally walk with God. Like, let's hang out. There was a kind of reality where a different set of things were possible, where they weren't going to die. And then what happens is there's this event that changes the kind of reality we're living in into a different kind of reality, where now they are going to die. And no, you can't walk with God in the same way anymore. And all of these other knock-on effects happen. There's this, this thing that happens right back at the beginning where it's like, we had this kind of reality, and then we tumbled into this kind of reality. And what's happening at the end here is this part of the story is looking for the mirror image to that. It's saying, hold on, like, this, this story's got to wrap up all the threads, clean back to the beginning. There has to be a different kind of the world, like that REM song. It's the end of the world as we know it. And that's actually the right way to say it. The end of the world as we know it, right? Now, I don't know about you, but like when I hear the end of the world, like I'm picturing like bombs and you know all of these horrible things, right? Like that's not what's happening here, right? What's happening here is it's the end of this kind of the world. The kind that's twisted, that's corrupted, that's bent out of order, where heaven and earth are separate from each other. Because in the beginning, they weren't. In the beginning, they were lined up. That's why heaven and earth both happened at the same time, and Adam and Eve were hanging out on earth and in heaven. What happens is they get sheared. They get split apart. And now we think like heaven's over there and earth's over here, and there's a long gap between them. And what's happening in this story is Jesus shows up and he goes, it's the end of that kind of the world. It's the end of the world as we know it. And he begins to not only talk like that's true, he begins to not only act like that's true, he actually goes one step further. This is a fascinating little thing in the scriptures. He actually talks like he's the end of the world. This, this is such a fascinating verse to me. You ever read the end of, of Revelation? Revelation itself is such a fascinating book, and I'm not going to pretend I understand most of it, or any of it, really, if I'm honest. But there's one verse that I can say, I think I know what that verse means, Right? And it's right at the end. It's one of the last books. It's in the last chapter. And Jesus says this. He says, I am the beginning and the end. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And when we hear that, what he's saying is he's saying this. I existed upstream of even that event. You go far enough back in the story, the only thing you run into is me. I'm the time before there was time. The scriptures use the term before the foundations of the world for that. The time before there was time, there was only me because I'm the word and everything came from the word as God spoke. So I'm the beginning, but I'm not only the beginning that all of the story emerges from, I am the end that all of the story converges to. I am the end of the story. I am the world that this world is coming into. And the New Testament contemplates this over and over and over again. It says all these things. Paul says these things like, in Jesus, all of heaven and all of earth are going to be reconciled into him. That's a statement that is Jesus is the end of the world. And so we have this fascinating thing where the guy who's the beginning of the story and the end of the story shows up in the middle of the story. And so he's the end of the beginning and the beginning of the end, in the middle. And what winds up happening is, if we think about it and we press this, okay, this leads us to a really interesting place that I think is really important for us to sit with because it's counterintuitive until it clicks and then everything changes. Jesus is God, right? Amen? Jesus is God, right? Now, 
When Jesus comes, the end comes. The end of the story that this whole thing is about, the creational exodus, has shown up in the person of Jesus. But God and his relationship to time is a little different than you and me and our relationship to time. The scriptures actually talk a fair bit about God's relationship to time, and they mostly say a set of things that are very hard to wrap your head around. And that's because whenever you start asking specific questions about God, you usually run into things that are called paradoxes. Because God doesn't fit in our world. And so the only way we can articulate things about him are statements that don't fit very nicely in our world, it turns out. So one of them would be this. If you ask the question, well, what's God's personal presence like? You'll get an answer in the scriptures that says something like this. Well, God is one, except that one is a father, son, and spirit who are not each other. But those are not three, they're one. So God's personal presence is one until it's three, until it's one, but it's three. <laughs> right? What's happening here is, is we have God's personal presence doesn't fit very cleanly in this creation. There's just no categories for it here because he's not part of the creation. So the best we got is the set of things that might actually not fit logic. But that doesn't mean it's not who God is. It just means God transcends creation. When you look at God in time, you run into another paradox. And just as a, a physicist, let me briefly get on a soapbox here for a second. Um, the most common thing I hear about this is people say things like God is outside time. That might be a fine logical statement, but I can't find a scripture that says that. So I would be very careful with statements like that and whatever implications follow afterwards because I think that's cute logical philosophy, but I'm not sure it's scripture. What scripture does say is actually a different set of things about God and time, which are far more complex. One of my favorite of them is where Second Peter, um, Peter is writing, and he's encouraging the diaspora he's writing to, and he says, guys, hang in there. I know it's hard, but God is going to take care of you, and never forget that with God, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Now, if you think about that thought, it's a really confusing thought. Chris, can you stand up? I'm going to use you as another visual here. All right, come on over here in the light, and hold your arms out for me as if you're a timeline. Thank you. Okay. Now, with putty, one day is like a day. And a thousand years is like a thousand years. But what Peter says is he says, don't forget that with the Lord, a thousand years is like a day. He's so far from the timeline that what seems like a thousand years to us is so short that it feels like a day. And at the same time, one day... <laughs> Nice biceps. <laughs> One day is like a thousand years. <laughs> you must work out, bro, right? <laughs> what Peter's saying is he's saying God is both closer to and further from the timeline at the same time. Now, I could understand if he picked one or the other. Never forget, God has the big picture view, right? A thousand years is like a day. Or I could imagine maybe the other way around. God has, like, God is so dialed in that, you know, one day is like a thousand years. But Peter says, never forget both are true at the same time. God is both closer and further from the timeline at the same time. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> God and time is really weird. And the further you press into it, I'd love to just, like, fire off a bunch of scriptures on it, but I don't think we have time for that. The further you press into it, the more you realize like God and time is strange. It doesn't work quite like the way we think it might work. And one of the places where this comes to a head is again in the book of Revelation where what's articulated is something that once again goes all the way back to the book of Exodus and kicks off at the burning bush. But we won't go into the details of that either. In the end, in Revelation, they're singing 
to Jesus and to the Father, and they sing in Revelation 4 and in Revelation 5, Holy, 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 the one who was and is and is to come. This is a time statement. And if you think about it, anything that I do either was or is or is to come. Right? Like, I had an enjoyable hamburger for lunch today. It's tasty. Got the job done. This morning, when I woke up, that hamburger was to come. And in fact, it was to come for my entire life. <laughs> Until, you know, 12.30 or whatever today. Right? And then, I sit down for lunch, the hamburger arrives, I bite in, <laughs> And the hamburger that I'm eating now is. It's happening. It's present. And I'm chomp, chomp, chomping the hamburger. And I'm enjoying it until, you know, I don't know, 1237. And now the hamburger was. Because it's gone. It's down here. And hopefully, you know, not too much of it shows up permanently. <laughs> right? And that hamburger now was for all eternity. So I wake up this morning, the hamburger will be. Until the hamburger is, until the hamburger was. For me, everything, everything that I do follows that same order. It's something I will do till it's something I am doing till it's something I did. And it's always in exactly that order. That never changes. That's part of being a human being. It's kind of, we're time simple or something like that. But God's not like that. He was and is and is to come. So for God, God can be done doing something he's not yet started. No, actually, let me, I know, I know. Once you say it that way, you're like, wait, what? Let me, let me read an actual, an actual verse from the actual Bible. This is Matthew 17. Just in case you're like, oh, wait a minute, I was with you, buddy, until you said that, exactly. right? And that's okay. That's okay if you are like, what's going on here, right? So this is immediately after the transfiguration. Jesus is walking down the, the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and he says, hey, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man's raised from the dead. This one stays under wraps until I resurrect. And the disciples asked him, then why do they say, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? So they're like, oh, we're talking about the, the, the end time stuff. I know they said Elijah comes first. I read that Malachi thing, right? <clears throat> and Jesus answered, look at this. Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, and they did to him whatever he pleased. So the Son of Man will also certainly suffer at their hands, and then the disciples understood he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. So they're like, hold on, we heard this Elijah guy comes. And he's like, he will come. And he will restore all things. Yes, that's right. That will happen, but it already happened. Because John the Baptist came. Wait, God is going to do something he, that already happened? Apparently, this time thing works really differently for God. He can be about to start something he's already did. He can be doing something that hasn't started yet. He can have something ahead of him that's already behind him. Is that weird? Yes, it's weird. Is it any more weird than the Trinity? No. You just haven't heard this one maybe before, right? But it's really weird, right? Okay, now why, am I, why are we going into all this? Putty, come on, you're getting like philosophical and it's like 9.30 on Friday night. Like what's wrong with you, right? No, it's only 9.04. We're fine. Okay, here's why I'm going into all of this, okay? That guy, Jesus, who shows up in Act 3, who is the end, he's the end of the story, he is the cosmic exodus, he's the thing this whole thing has been leading to, that Jesus is the one who was and is and is to come. And what that means is, when the end of the story shows up, See, here's what I think, and this is why people get confused about the Bible. They go, oh, well, in the beginning, the fall fell, and that happened, 
And so someday the fall will unfall. And if I look around, that clearly hasn't happened because it's pretty terrible down here sometimes. So that must be like over there somewhere. And when we work that logic, it shows that we don't understand the nature of the end. Because we're saying, well, because the end hasn't come, therefore it's not here. But Jesus is the one who was and is and is to come. Which means when the end of the story shows up, when the great cosmic exodus shows up, when God changes the kind of reality that we're living in, when he delivers it from sin and sickness and death, the way that works is it takes a was and is and is to come shape. The creational exodus was. It happened. It happened with the guy articulated in this story. He showed up and he ended the story. It happened. It's actually already over. The end has showed up. But that guy not only was, he also is. Which means right now in this moment, the creational exodus is happening. It's present tense reality. The deliverance of creation is here because Jesus is. But it not only was, well done, it not only is, it is to come, which means the creational exodus, yes, it is ahead of us. Creation will be more free than it is right now. It will be delivered. It will be transformed. And because this is the shape of this guy, Jesus, who is the end, this is how reality now works. It's actually always like this after this Jesus guy shows up. That's just kind of a weird thought, right? Like, what? Like, putty, what? 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 Yeah, I know it's weird. I know it's weird. But the kingdom's weird. This is why Jesus called it a mystery. It's the mystery of the kingdom. It's hidden. It's hard, right? But here's an analogy that I really like for it. I, 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 I'm a fan of a party. I like a good party. Parties are fun. Anybody else like parties? I really enjoyed that meal we got to eat together, right? Thank you for that. That was so good. And everybody who, who did it, I mean, I know you guys paid for it, and, but everybody else did the work, right? And that's, that's great, right? So I love parties. Now imagine we were going to set up a party that started tomorrow afternoon, right? And in that party, we gave everybody in this room instructions. Hey, party starting tomorrow afternoon. Maybe we don't even give the exact time, right? And we just say this, show up, bring something to share. Bring some food, bring, bring dessert, bring some drinks, whatever, right? Show up, bring something to share. So everybody in the room gets the note. Nobody knows the exact time. So what happens is what happens at a typical party, people start showing up at all different times, right? So let's say some of us are like, I'm so excited about the party. So I'm like, afternoon, it is technically afternoon at 12.10. So <laughs> I show up at 12.10, and Kirk, he's a party animal. He was there five minutes before me, right? Okay, and the person sitting next to you showed up, and there were two other people, three other people here. So we show up, and there's like 10 of us in the room, but we've got brownies, and we've got hamburgers, and we've got crisps, and somebody turns on the music, and the music's blaring, and it's not very big, but we have a party happening. This party is totally a party. But then somebody shows up at 1220. They rock on in, and they've got, like, their family dessert, you know? Like the one that's been in the family for, like, you know, 75 years. And it's the kind of thing that they never give away, but everybody knows, like, man, I really wish I, really wish I could have those whatever they are, right? So they show up, and they walk in the door. And you know what happens when we're up here? We're partying, right? Greg's a party animal. Trust me, okay? We're, we're up here partying, and they crack open the door. And you know what happens? We go, hey, come on in. It's so good to see you. Come on in here. You're put, put, the, put the dessert here. I'm first in line. You know, we settle it. And what happens is the party just became more of a party. And what happens 15 minutes later when the next people show up? And half an hour after that when the next people show up? And then an hour later you show up. And then 10 minutes after that another group of people shows up. And what happens is it's like there's a party that's becoming more of a party. Is it already a party? It's totally already a party. It's not lacking as a party in any way. But what's happening is it's becoming more of a party each time somebody shows up. 
each time somebody arrives. It's kind of like that, except the person who arrives every time at the party is Jesus. What the scripture stories tell us is to say, look, the party's already started. The end's actually already here. It's present. We're not only looking forward to it. It's not like, oh, it hasn't happened. The party's already started. The end is already here. God has already stitched heaven and earth back together. Do you want to walk with him the way Adam and Eve used to walk with him? You can. That's why we, when we get saved, we, we join the party. And in the party, we find out that God and man can walk together again. And in the party, we find out that all the sin and all the brokenness and all the twistedness and all the messed upness of this world, that all exists outside the party. But inside the party, behold, Jesus is making all things new. And so we're invited to join the party because Jesus has come, the end has arrived. But not only is the party started and are we invited to it, Jesus himself keeps arriving over and over and over and over again, crashing like waves over creation, filling creation with more and more of the party as it becomes more and more of the party. And that's the kingdom of God. That's why he says things like, it's like a seed that grows, right? It's a thing that gets started, but it keeps self-actualizing. It keeps becoming more. So that means, yes, you're invited to the party, but the party today is actually not the party tomorrow. Because by tomorrow, more of Jesus is going to have showed up in this world. But the thing is, is Jesus is never going to run out of himself to bring to this world. We're not just talking about like a set of people in this room. We're talking about the infinite God, which is never going to run out of bringing himself to a finite world. And so after Jesus comes, this is why we redate the timeline with him. Because after Jesus comes, the party that's becoming more of a party is the only thing that happens for the entire rest of history. And at some point, evil runs out. But that doesn't mean the party isn't still becoming more of a party because just because Satan is overthrown doesn't mean there's not more Jesus left. And so the party becomes more of a party over and over, day after day. This is what reality is now. And that's the gospel of the kingdom of God. That Jesus showed up and he started the party that is the end. It's already happened. We're not waiting for it to happen. Jesus already did it. But not only has he already done it, he's actually doing it right now. So we're in here worshiping. And it's like, this is amazing. This is fantastic. And you know what we find out? Jesus knocks on the door and walks into the room while we're worshiping. And the party has become more of a party. More of Jesus has filled this place. And that was amazing Five minutes ago, that was more than five minutes ago, like an hour ago, right? <laughs> that was amazing an hour ago, but it's also still happening now. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm waiting. Would anybody open the door and let me in? So he says in the book of Revelation, I am right outside the party. Let me in the party. And so our gospel is a gospel not just that the party has already started, that's an awesome gospel. People don't know that. They need to know that, right? The part of the gospel is we're not waiting for the party down there, right? There, there is a party down there, and I'm going to be part of the party down there, but I can be part of the party now, too. And so we do get to welcome people into the party now, right? We also get to look forward to the party later, totally, we get both. We get to be greedy, right? It's like God. You don't have to pick like Father, Son, or Spirit. Which one do you like? You get one of the three. Like that's not how it works. You get one, you get it all. In the same way, when you get the party, you get all the layers of the party. So the party's already started. Woohoo! You get to live in the end today. You get to wake up and be like, oh my gosh, like eternity's already started. I'm already living here. How's that change your day? Right? 
How's that approach the problems you have? Oh my gosh, like I don't have the money that I need, but I'm already in eternity and the streets of gold's here, so maybe I'll just scrape a little bit of that off and throw that in my bank account and we're good to go. Here we go, right? Like seriously, the party's already started. So you wake up in the party every day, right? And we also look forward to the party that is to come. We go, man, like I'm living in the party today, but as I look around, there's an awful lot that's not in the party yet. And I don't like that. And today I'm going to do everything I can to help bring more of the party, but I'm one person, and at the end of today, this probably isn't all going to be the party. But that's okay, because I read the back of the book, and the party will always be more of a party. So that's going to catch up with all of it eventually. I don't need to stress about this or that or this or that. or that. Like, it's all going to come under Jesus' lordship. Not one bit is not going to. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. There's no part of creation that is not going to come underneath Jesus' lordship. And that's an important thing for us to settle ourselves in too. Not only do I wake up in the party, I look around and I go, yeah, the party's coming for all of this. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Jesus, like the party's kicked off, the heaven party, there's nothing stopping it. This is going to be amazing, right? But not only are those two things true, that would be plenty enough to be really excited. But the third thing is also true, which is there is not a moment when Jesus is not knocking on the door to bring more of himself to our world. He says, he says these challenging, confronting things, like I wish I could actually believe this. I'm trying to believe it. He says, my father is always working. Like, if I actually believed that, I would live so differently. Like, there's not a minute that you live that the Father's not at work. That's unbelievably confronting, right? I'm like, I consider it an awesome day if I'm dialed into that, like, 1% of my day, <laughs> right? The Father's always working. The party is becoming more of a party, could become more of a party right now. And what Jesus does is he says, look, guys, I stand at the door and knock, but you're the one who gets to open it. You're the one who welcomes me in. You're the one who makes the space for the party to be more of a party in this moment. And so what that means is every part of our lives is confronted with this reality. The party can become more of a party in your workplace. Jesus is knocking at the door of your workplace. He's knocking at the door of your school. He's knocking on the doors of your neighborhood. Yes, he's knocking on the doors of our church meetings. He's knocking on the doors of all of them. There's not a moment that goes by that the kingdom of heaven is not like right on the other side of a welcoming eternity into the present. He always stands at the door and knocks. There's not a moment he's not doing that. Which means we are people that are constantly confronted by eternity. Every moment of every day is kind of pregnant with the possibility of eternity. Because the end is always coming. And Jesus is always picking us his people, to be a part of the great creational exodus. See, what's awesome about this is that means this ark, it actually doesn't stop at the end of this book. Because the thing that gets established in Act 3, that the party has started and is coming and is happening right now, that is still the story that you and I are living in a couple of millennia later. There's a continuity that we live straight into the story that gets told here, which runs right back through the story of these first two acts. In other words, that story is our story, which is the story of the kingdom of God. Let's pray. You guys can stay up here or not. I'll leave that up to you. <clears throat> Let's everybody stand. I know it's like, Late enough on Thursday, the blood sugar is coming down a little bit. Thank you to my 
trilogy of incredible Bible acts. <laughs> Take a deep breath. I want you to just settle yourself in this moment. 